Hi everybody, welcome to our helper video on how to run dependent t-tests and SPSS. Let's get started. All right, so here we see the opening window for SPSS. I've already pulled it up and it's ready to go. So now I just need to load my data. So open another file. And then as usual, I don't see my file here in downloads because it's only looking for SPSS files and I have sent you an Excel file. So we scroll down to all files and then all my files show up. So I select the data that I've downloaded, which for this is just uh, some example data that I've come up with. But I select the correct Excel file and click open. As per usual, we ignore this file, right? Because we're not going to be changing any of our value labels uh, for this. And I've only sent you an Excel file that includes the variables that you need and nothing extra. So we just click OK. And here is our data. So this is the study description for this example. This data represents fake quiz data. A professor is interested in whether her lecture on adolescent development effectively covers the required curriculum. She first gives the class a pretest on adolescent development, and that is the first column of data in your Excel file. She then presents the one hour lecture and then gives the class the exact same test, but as a post-test. And the scores on their post-test are the second column of data in your file. The professor hypothesizes that her lecture will produce better scores. So that's this data here. You can clearly see that one column is labeled pretest and one column is labeled post-test. If the pretest had more than one question, we would have to calculate a total score for the pretest, and if the post-test had more than one item, we would have to calculate a total score for the post-test. In this example, I'm not doing that because in my previous video, we demonstrated how to compute a new variable. Consider that that was already done, and this is a pretest and post-test total score. The first thing I want to notice is that when I imported the data, it imported as nominal. Notice how the symbol that is in front of the word pretest and post-test is three colored circles and that when you hover over each variable it says measure nominal. Well, a pre and post-test is not a nominal variable. So I'm going to go to variable view, I'm going to come over to measurement and I'm going to change it to scale. I know it's scale and not ordinal because your score on a quiz is not ranked ordered is a scale variable because the difference between a 5 or a 4 or a 3 on a quiz is an equal mathematical difference. Now when I come back I can see that the sign that's in front of both of those has changed to a ruler and when I hover above it it says measure scale. So now it's time to run our dependent t-test. I go up to the analyze menu and just like for one sample t-test and independent sample t-test our paired or dependent samples t-test is under the compare means menu. Again, this is one of the times where SPSS is all about learning SPSS language. But the reason why it's called compare means is that a t-test is basically comparing the means of two different things while taking into account variance. So a one sample t-test compares the mean of a one sample to a population, independent samples compares the means of two independent groups, and a paired samples t-test is either on a true paired sample or is a repeated measure where there is just one group that we're measuring repeatedly. So I'm going to so I'm going to select paired samples t-test and this is where I get my same menu that I've seen multiple times. All of the menus in SPSS again list the possible variables for that test. There's an arrow and then there's a selection box. So I take the variable that I want from the left, I click the arrow to move it over to the right. So I take my pretest and I move it over and my post test and move it over. For this one, I don't need to click the options button because in the options button, it just allows me to change the confidence interval percentage. We will not be doing that for these labs. So I don't need to click the options menu. I just need to move them over and then click okay. And here is our output. So our output shows me the mean average for the pre and post test, the number of students, and as you can see, it's the same. So everybody who took the pretest took the post test. There were no dropouts. I have the standard deviation for each of those means and the standard error of the mean. The next area after the paired samples statistic is the paired samples correlation. Why is it running a correlation? I asked it to run a paired samples t-test. Well, the reason why is because 
While we are primarily interested in finding out whether or not these two variables are statistically significantly different, it's also sometimes important to consider how strongly the two variables are associated with one another. For this example, you can see that the pre and post test are not significantly correlated to one another because the statistical significance is high. Now that makes sense because this is just an Excel file where I randomly typed in some data. If this was real data, then you would expect that correlation to be statistically significant. And so this significant value would be less than 0 0.05. The last part is the paired samples t-test output as a whole. You can see that it is taking the pretest and minusing the post-test. And thus the mean difference is negative. This is an important thing to remember. If the pretest is put in first and you're subtracting the post-test, your mean difference is going to be negative. That means that the pretest value is smaller than the post-test value. Well, that makes sense. In this case, we want the post-test to be a greater number. I can go back up here to the paired sample statistics output and see that my post-test average is higher than my pre-test average. So that's why this value, the mean difference from the pre to post-test, and this t-statistic is negative. If I go back into my data and I rerun the test by putting the post-test first and then the pretest, I get the same values but with a different sign. And again, this might help me remember that that means that the post test did better. You should be able to pay attention to if it says pretest minus post test and that is negative, that that means the post test value is greater than the pretest value. You need to think about it this way if you're giving a measure and you want your participants to do better or get a higher score on the post-test than the pretest, then your t-value and the difference between those two scores should be negative. Something bigger, right, is being subtracted from something smaller. But let's say, for example, you want people to score lower on the post-test. When would you ever want that? Well, if the post-test is measuring something bad, we often think about tests as only measuring things like how much you learned and how you're doing, right? So we, as students and professors, are used to things being better on a post-test. But if your post-test was something like the Beck Depression Inventory and you were giving participants the Beck Depression Inventory and then a workshop on coping skills, you would want them to have less depression on the post-test. So when you see something like a pre and a post-test, and you are hypothesizing that there will be not only a difference, but a specific direction for that difference. You wanna make sure you do that extra cognitive step of thinking, I want one of these to be greater or less than the other. Which one? And again, if it's something positive, in general, we want the post-test to be higher. And if it's something negative, like looking at something like symptoms, we typically want that post-test score to be lower. If we look down here, right, we have our mean and our standard deviation of the mean, and this is about the difference between the pre and post test. And if we look more towards the right, we see that we have our t value, our degrees of freedom, and our statistical significance. Our significance is less than 0. 0.0000, so it is statistically significant. I also have my degrees of freedom, which, as you can see, is n minus 1. There were 30 students, minus 1 is 29, and here is our t value. That t value is clearly greater than the t value that was required for a degree of freedom 29. Now, if we think back, though, the original description talked about that the professor is hypothesizing that her lecture will produce better scores. Better scores means that this should actually be a one-tailed test, but the significance I get is for a two-tailed test. In fact, there isn't an option in the menu either for us to make it a one-tailed test. So instead, if the study description that you have is about getting better scores or worse scores, but regardless if your description is for a one-tailed test, we have to do one additional step. So this is the t-value for our analysis. 
And I can already guesstimate that if it is that significant for a two-tail test, it's likely significant for a one-tail test. But we do need to double check. So I'm going to then pull up our t-table. And our t-table, I want to read from this top column, proportion in a one-tail test and that we want to set it at, of course, 0 0.05. So I'm reading down this third column of data. I need to find the degrees of freedom for 29 and come across that row. I can see that the required t-value for a statistically significant one-tailed test for a degree of freedom 29 is 1.699. Our t value is 7.478. So clearly, it's also statistically significant at the 0 0.05 level. In fact, even at the 0 0.005 level, it would be statistically significant. So, this is an effective lecture because it did effectively increase scores on the post test from the pretest. Hopefully that's been helpful and I look forward to seeing your labs.